the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Bend your ear to our prayers, Lord Christ, and come among us by your gracious life and death for us. Bring light into the darkness of our hearts and anoint us with your spirit. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Gospel reading comes from John, the ninth chapter. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, no, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened, he said. He is a prophet. 
The Jew did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may, I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see. And those who do not see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say, We see, your sin remains. Word of God, Word of Life. Thanks be to God. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. A father of three young boys says it's sometimes hard to know who to blame when something happens at the house. And then he tells you his solution. He says, I send all three of them to bed after supper without getting to watch TV or anything else. And then in the morning, I go after the one with the black eye. One day there was a little girl who was riding her bike down the street when suddenly she hit her head on a low hanging tree limb. And she comes running into the house crying, saying, Mommy, Mommy, Joey hurt me. Her mother looked at her and said, Come on, sissy, Joey didn't hurt you. Joey's not even here. Joey went to the grocery store with his father. And the little girl got the startled look on her face and then Bewildered, she says, does that mean things like this can happen on their own at any time? And then she added, whoa, bummer. Well, it is a bummer. To think that bad things can happen to someone anywhere at any time and no one may be the blame. In our lesson from the Gospel of John today, Jesus' disciples come across a man who was born blind. And the disciples asked Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? There it is, that question. Who is to blame for this man's misfortune? We think that if we can somehow affix blame, we can make the situation better. We might find some meaning out of it or might even find a solution. That if there's someone to blame, 
then we can get control of life. We can regain that control. But if there's no one to blame, if these things can just happen, then we don't have control over life. And that can be scary. Jesus's response to the disciples is an intriguing one. He says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but he was born blind that God's work might be revealed in him. So what does that mean? How can an affliction, especially one has devastating, has blindness, actually help to display the work of God? Well, let's take a few moments to examine this text. First of all, we see Christ heals this man born blind. That's important. It's not God's will for this man or anyone to be blind. Blindness can have many causes, including disease, trauma, and sometimes, maybe it is the case for this man, a defective gene. We just don't know. But what we do know is this. If you are blind, physically blind, it's not helpful to think that God wants it that way. If you are dealing with cancer or some other adverse condition, it's not helpful to believe that God wants it that way. If you are going through a devastating time financially, it's not helpful to believe that God wants it that way. You see, God's will is to work for good for those who love the Lord. That's an important reason why Jesus healed this man born blind. Healing is God's will. That when we get to thinking that we need to blame someone when something is going on in our life, an extreme heartache or whatever, then we might actually lose the very power that can help bring healing into our lives. Instead, we need to remember that God's will is for our ultimate good. So look for Christ's healing presence in your life. Maybe it will be a physical healing. Maybe it'll be an emotional healing, a mental healing. Maybe it will be the healing of your heart, your emotions and your feelings over whatever need or hurt you are experiencing. God can take any adverse situation in our lives and out of it bring forth a blessing. Pastor Kirk Greenfield tells about a friend of his who was a Korean War veteran. And he enlisted in the army and shortly thereafter he put in to receive airborne training. He had heard that people willing to parachute out of airplanes received higher pay. But he soon discovered that higher pay was not a good enough reason to jump out of an airplane. And so he put in for a transfer. The army didn't take too kindly to his transfer request. In fact, they punished him for his request. They put him on grunt patrol and every day he'd have to march many miles. And then to make matters worse, at the end of the day, he would, he would have to dig along with the others on Grump Patrol these elaborate box holes. And this went on for several weeks until finally he was deployed to Korea. And Greenfield said this is where his friend gets rather emotional at this point as he tells his story. He says that one night he and a deployment of 20 other soldiers were told to hold the line during a fierce battle. And so they prepared to dig in. But the other soldiers really did not know how to build a decent foxhole. But Greenfield's friend did because of being on grunt patrol. And so he helped them build this fine foxhole. During the night, they were assaulted several times by enemy troops. And in the morning, as the sun began to rise, they saw that there were 30 dead enemy soldiers in front of their position. However, there had been a cost. The only survivors was Greenfield's friend and three other American soldiers. In fact, the situation was so desperate that when the British Royal Marines arrived, they almost shot 
the four survivors, believing no Allied troops could have survived the onslaught. Later, as they were being transported behind enemy lines, it was bitterly cold. And many of the soldiers rode in the troop uh, convoy trucks. But the lack of movement led to their fingers and their toes falling off from frostbite. But Greenfield's friend chose to walk instead. Well, when darkness came, they came under enemy aerial attack. And because they had their lights on, the convoy trucks were easy targets. But Greenfield's friend survived because he chose to walk behind the convoy. And Greenfield's friend gets tears in his eyes and he says to him, people wonder why I love the Lord. Twice in 24 hours, he had almost been killed. But because he knew how to dig a good foxhole and because he had the stamina and the strength to walk rather than ride in a truck, he survived. And both of those abilities came as a result of the punishments he had received while on grunt patrol. In all things, God works for good for those who love the Lord. I know sometimes when we're going through a difficult time, it's hard to remember this, but it's true. God can use any circumstance. When you're going through a difficult time, look and see if there's some way that it may glorify God. Look for some way that it might be helpful to you and to others. Don't let the experience make you bitter, but let it make you better. And that leads to one other point I want to make about this text today. And that is this. The most tragic blindness is the blindness of the heart. You know, it's interesting. This should have been the most joyful day of this man's life. Shouldn't someone have thrown him a party? Or his neighbors were not going to do that. In fact, some of them refused to even acknowledge he was the same person they had known before. Why? Because it, it didn't fit into their theology. They had never seen a man born blind to be healed before. And so they refused to accept it. The same is true for the leaders in the synagogue. They tell this man that he will be expelled from the synagogue unless he recants his testimony that Jesus healed him. You see, the neighbors and these leaders both were far blinder than the blind man had ever been because they were blind to what God was doing in their midst. It wasn't that they were bad people, they weren't. It's just that they had locked themselves into seeing life in a certain way and they refused to see the broader picture. You and I need to increase our understanding about life to know that God's perspective is much larger than our own. That instead of seeking to place blame when something bad goes wrong, we should affirm that God's will is for our ultimate good. That all things work for good for those who love the Lord, including whatever adversity you are facing this day. Maybe God will use that experience to make you stronger. Maybe it will help you become more compassionate uh, for others in the midst of their struggles. Maybe it will draw you closer to God. Who knows how God will use your struggles? But just try to understand that God sees the broader picture and then pray that God would help you see God's hand, God's plan, and most importantly, your part in it. Amen.
Sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of creation. Eternal God, you seal us by the Holy Spirit and mark us with the cross of Christ forever in baptism. Inspire us by your love as together we strive for justice and peace in all of the earth. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Creating God, by your word you have made all things, and you hate nothing you have made. Teach us to perceive the beauty of the breath of your creation, from the grandest mountain range to the smallest springtime bud. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Powerful God, you anoint kings and establish rulers. Guide the work of heads of state and elected officials. Encourage them to lead with justice and to remove barriers that impede the well-being of all. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Shepherding God, you lead us beside still waters and restore our souls. Keep watch over those who weep. Tend all who are sick and comfort all those who are grieving. We especially pray for all those on the prayer list of this congregation and all those we hold silently in our hearts. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God, our host, you fill us at your table with more than we could ever ask. Feed us with hunger for justice. Equip the feeding ministry of this congregation and the community. Nourish us so we can nourish our neighbors. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God of history, with thanksgiving we remember our ancestors in faith who cared for all your people. We praise you for the ways they formed the faith of others and continue to inspire us. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Gathered into one body by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.